Hi, this is Soham. I am the co-founder and CEO at Shipsy. In the recent Diwali sale season, I bought a TV. This one-click purchase has a very complex supply chain behind it, starting from importing components from multiple countries, assembling them in a factory, shipping the finished TVs to a warehouse and finally delivering it to your door. In this episode of the Founder Thesis Podcast, your host Akshay Dutt is talking with Soham Choksi, the founder of the logistics management SaaS platform Shipsy. Shipsy is the operating system of logistics, helping companies run logistics operations efficiently and with minimal paperwork and information loss. It is the brain that directs all the organs of a logistics organization to work smoothly. Soham is an investment banker and has had a fascinating journey of discovering product market fit and building Shipsy into a global SaaS business. Listen on, and if you like such insightful conversations with disruptive startup founders, then do subscribe to the Founder Thesis podcast on any audio streaming app. In this entire complex world of uh, everything finance, global finance and trading and global markets, there are so many different participants. Think about it. So we're a bank, there are traders, there are credit agencies, there are research houses. There are so many different people that are there. There are customers, right? So many different people. Now, use this platform called Bloomberg. And that was one single thing where I used to log in at 8 a.m. and log out at 1 a.m. or whatever. But that was that like one single platform that actually connected together everyone in the ecosystem. So all our chats, all our trades, everything to execute, all the data, all the analytics, all the collaboration was all on that one single platform. And we thought it was obvious that for kind of industries where there's an ecosystem, and entities should collaborate with each other. Platforms must exist in that sense. So that's kind of what it was. And uh, that's right. But and how, how, how did you want, decide to do it in logistics? Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Back in 2015, that's when we started off. E-commerce was just on the rise. And as end customers, you know, we always had that terrible experience of accepting packages, returning it, you're in office, it gets undelivered, it gets returned, and then you're ordering it again. And it was a mess. Obviously, the world has changed since then. But back in the day, it was really on the rise. And we were thinking that on the one hand, people are talking about going to Mars and then there's this. <laughs> there's a big gap, obviously. So, And we saw that, again, there's multiple parties that are there. So there's the e-commerce company, there's the logistics company, there's the seller. Uh, there is us as the end customer, there is a driver. There are so many different people that are collaborating together, so to say, on one transaction, which is the delivery of the shipment. And everything was happening manually. Right? You won't believe it. Like people used to go out with these run sheets and take physical signatures. And you remember, right, back in the day, it's kind of that way. So super inefficient. And we thought that it's a multi-trillion dollar industry, logistics. Goods have been moving around forever. So that was actually the starting point that A, the TAM has to be massive. The total addressable market has to be massive. So it's a multi-trillion dollar industry, right? You do anything decent, it's going to be big. So I think that's the first criteria that we had that look, while it looks interesting, is the TAM big? And the answer was yes, it's massive. Is the idea ahead of its time? Probably. Right? But it should not be too ahead. And then look, we just had that experience and we saw that look, there, there has to be a better way. How can all of these people collaborate manually? And imagine if instead of Bloomberg, like we didn't have Bloomberg, everything was on emails and Excels. How inefficient it would be. And that was the main driving factor behind doing it. And, and there were a lot of personal experience also. So Dhruv, uh, my co-founder, he shipped a bicycle from his home and it got stolen somewhere in the middle. Right? It was lying at some hub for a month, two months. And then I think someone just drove off with it. So, uh, you know, a lot of different experiences were kind of told us that A, there is a problem for sure, right? And customer expectations are through the roof. What the industry has to offer is nowhere close. And B, it's a massive market. So that's where it is. And we want to solve it using a technology first approach. So that was the genesis of why logistics and why we thought about this. Yeah. And uh, but that's yeah, a fairly yeah. broad area logistics. You did you like narrow down uh, what within logistics what you want did, to tackle? We did. Yeah, we did. For us, at that time, it was just the last mile. And I, because see, as end customers, that's also, for example, when you order something from a Flipkart or Amazon, or is the driver coming to your doorstep yeah. and giving that. But what goes behind it, 
their entire massive supply chain that goes behind it is unknown to us. We don't see it. It somehow just magically appears at the doorstep. <laughs> so anyway, so as end customers, the only thing we saw was the last one. So we said that, look, let's, and that, that, that was the world we knew. And we thought that world is also very big, which it is. But when we got in, we realized that, oh, look, while last mile is there and that's massive, that's just a drop in the ocean. There is a massive ocean of global supply chain, global logistics that's powering all of this. Like when you order something, it's probably it made its first mile journey from, let's say, some other country to some warehouse in India. Then from that warehouse, it went to some fulfillment center. From that fulfillment center, it came to the delivery center and from the delivery center, it came to home. So it, it actually, there's a lot of decoupled different transactions that actually go into having a package uh, available for you to order and be getting it delivered to you in the promised time. So kind of when we got in, we saw last while because that was the only thing that we saw as end customers really. But then as we got in, we kind of approached it through first principles and that's a whole different story in itself because like when we started off as aggregators, right? kind of just history. for last mile. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if uh, you as an individual, you wanted to send something somewhere or you forgot your charger at home and you were to instantly summon somebody to go and get it. So we did that. And if you want to send something else, we used to aggregate across multiple carriers and kind of be that single platform where it was technology plus operations. Um, and at one time, we actually had about 80 or 90 drivers <laughs> doing pickups and deliveries around. Okay. So, so yeah. was this like a Denso model? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Back okay. in the time. And, and it was a, a decent scale, but it was burning a lot of cash. <laughs> you had raised money or you were using your own? We had raised an angel round. We had raised okay. the angel round with this. And mm-hmm. that's another interesting story, actually. So did that on a metro ride. Uh, so that well, was how impressive. did you do that then? Yeah, so I think so when we came to Gurgaon, so like kind of landed mm-hmm. in Gurgaon, the first thing you realize is, hey, look, uh, there's no public transportation. You have the metros mm-hmm. and all those kind of stuff. There's no auto rickshaws and all that kind of stuff. So kind of got accustomed to metro rides, all of those things. And at that time, we were also aggregators. So we were doing this whole send anything anywhere, 49 rupees for 500 grams anywhere in the country, send anything like anywhere. Like a courier aggregator, like you yeah, would Yeah, courier aggregator. Dark, yeah, exactly. Like that and the hyperlocal, the intracity. Mm-hmm. If it's something local, instant mm-hmm. local delivery. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. And uh, so there the was an incident where one of our customers, he accidentally switched the labels on the packages. So a package that had to go to Noida ended up in Delhi and the one that had to go to Delhi ended up in Noida, right? Uh, I mean, it happens due to tech, uh, technology, uh, you know, errors happen. But uh, you know, obviously, we want to ensure that uh, the customer is happy and... Uh, uh, and we realized that <laughs> logistics companies don't offer return services. Not all of them offer <laughs> pickups. So it's, it's gone. It's basically just lying over there. So I said, then look, whatever it is, I, I, I'll go myself and I'll just exchange the packages. <laughs> so uh, it's like a Sunday morning, uh, went in the metro, I was, was going to go to Delhi and then just switch the packages. Went back right? to Delhi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And then when you're traveling from Gurga, to get a seat in the metro, you need to get in at city center. Yeah. You have to get it other you don't get a stall. Like it's going to be an interesting. So let me at, at least get a seat. That's the least I could do for my Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah, I did that. But, and then there was this kid that was on the metro ride and he clearly wanted to sit right. I was like, he just, just sit right. Uh, <laughs> I have enough to deal with already. <laughs> right. So did that and then uh, so at that time we had the Shixi t-shirt with a massive logo. So his father actually noticed that and he started asking me that what do you do etc. And I told him what he uh, does. So uh, he was actually turned out to be an investment banker, a private equity investor. And he was starting out his own angel investment firm as well. And he was actually showing his son the metro ride. Right? He had come from London etc. etc. And so in that 40 minutes and he made us an offer for our angel. And we kind of declined it then. Because we wanted to reach a slightly larger scale. But yeah, we kept in touch. And then, so then he also introduced us to someone that acquired the EdTech company. (laughs) 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 I think just work in mysterious ways. Yeah, so that was the uh, thing. And then I think, so we had raised our angel round, but it was still burning a lot of money. And look, uh, coming from a business family background, always thought that, look, sure, business should make money. Can't uh, see so much money being burned and nothing being made. And obviously from a, a standpoint of, okay, yes, we were very popular. People knew us and all of those things. But uh, I didn't, we thought somewhere we were not actually solving the problem. We were sugarcoating the problem. <laughs> so we said that, look, why the logistics companies have their own issues that sugarcoated with this nice front end layer, but that does not actually solve the problem because 
the logistics companies, they themselves need a lot of help in terms of really figuring out things. So kind of that's uh, said that, look, let's take a step back. And we wanted to solve this technology problem, not figure out how to deal with like driver unions asking for 50 pesa more per kilometer of fuel. It's, and that's not what we are specialized in, right? So we said that we want to focus on tech. We built out the tech internally for us to solve it and we're willing to offer it to you. Uh, to solve your issues and working together as partners. And because that at the time, we were just like eight, ten people. And it was basically selling us as a group of people that are going to affect change. Right? Mm-hmm. At the time, God introduced to the CEO of uh, DTDC Express. So he he was driving the whole transformation for DTDC. And then and, and he really believed in us and DTDC as a group. They really believed in us that, look, these guys can help us. And it was a win-win relationship for them. They were kind of getting uh, it built out a lot as per their requirements and for us we were actually building out our product as per industry standards and at a scale that we could actually you talk about maybe right in terms of the benefits so that was where we started off our journey of SaaS so we did the aggregation bit for about three or four months I think we very soon realized that that's not really going to scale and we said that look let's focus on the core technology problem and that's kind of where we raised our we kind of extended the angel round and gotten more investment for the SaaS part. But again, we were not burning a lot of money because again, SaaS, it's just basically people expenses. Right? And we were actually, from the very start, we've been fundamentally very strong, near profitable, year on year, overall profitability. So then that's how it was. And that's kind of how we got into the whole SaaS aspect of things. So the, the pitch to investors was that you would help companies like DTDC and other such right. companies with yeah. custom built workflow automation software. Yeah, so the entire, because, so think of it this way, all the new age logistics companies that's come, uh, that are coming around and then for all, the entire logistics universe that's there, what is that one technology platform that exists? It's pretty much everyone has to build out their own internal systems. And look, engineering, core engineering is not the focus or is not the core business of a logistics company. Core business is operations. Operations, yeah. They need a technology partner to help them on their journey. They're just specialized in this. So that's kind of what it was. But again, at the time, it was, uh, you were still really just scratching the surface. Right? Because when we started working with them, we realized that, look, A, this is a global problem. It's not just a pro- India problem. B, it's not just last mile. The entire first mile, mid mile, all of those things is where help is required. And then we also saw that, look, it's not just the logistics companies. The customers of the logistics companies, the retailers, the manufacturers, the distributors, they need a lot of help because look, if the logistics companies need help figuring out where the packages are, their customers working with multiple logistics companies, they would need more help. So then we said we got into retail, manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, those, the shipper side basically. So see, basically there is the logistics company, there is the shipper. So, wait, wait, tell me, yeah. like you got DTDC as your first client. Yeah. What were you building for them? You were building like the last mile delivery? Yeah. Okay, something which from order to delivery, that entire... So from the software. last mile hub, the last mile delivery center or the branch hmm. to the end customer, just that bit. Yeah. Which so like, like uh, routing. Exactly. And- so the whole route planning, route optimization, the driver app, the dispatch dashboard, customer communication, all of that stuff. How? Logically, it would make sense to then go out and find more DTDC-like companies yeah. and sell the same product to other companies yeah. because you already built it. What made you want to go to a different audience altogether? What you're saying, the buyer side, you... Yeah. But that was over time. Our first obvious thing was to go to more logistics companies. Look, as a SaaS, this was one of our learnings. I mean, it, looking back, obviously it all made sense, but you, were, you wanted to build a very fundamentally strong product and see to get to product market fit. It's critical to have anchor customers because if you go uh, out very quick, you're going to wind up in this crazy customization yeah, loop, you're right? Not, where we have product can not make it. No, we won't make anyone happy. And then the customers will basically start churning. So it's very important to have some anchor customers with who we build out the fund, the foundation. So then kind of got connected with more logistics companies in India. Then their trading partners, logistics companies in the Middle East. So that was our second destination. So we partnered with a few of the large logistics companies in Saudi Arabia. And we got to about five or six customers. These were our anchor customers, right? And we went very deep. We didn't do just last mile. Then we did first mile. Then we did mid mile. We did analytics. We did the customer facing portals. Right? What would be, give me, help me understand what would be first mile and mid mile for a company like DTTC. Give me some examples. Yeah, absolutely. So let's say you're a small shop 
and you want to send something from say Delhi to say Chennai. So the first mile, so you raise a pickup request from the app. So the first mile is essentially somebody that comes to do the pickup and gets it to the first location. So let's say I'm doing it from Gurgaon. So there's going to be some branch in Gurgaon where the pickup will come to. Then the mid mile is essentially it goes from Gurgaon to Delhi, Delhi to Chennai and Chennai to the local branch near the delivery address. So that's the whole mid mile piece, which is the hub to hub movement. And then comes the last mile. Just um, from hub to home, hub to doorstep. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you gave your clients, say DTDC, you gave them like a white labeled app for customers yes. who want to order a pickup. Exactly. Not just that, the entire operations management tools as well. So the app for the drivers to get the pickup requests, scan all of the shipments, the dispatch screen at the hub so that they could see all of the pickups, deliveries, the live operations, the live statistics, any ex- escalations, any exceptions, reports, all of that stuff. Proof of delivery on the driver app, a uh, complete integrated platform for operations management. Okay. Okay. Which sounds pretty powerful. Like essentially uh, opening a logistics company is then just like a plug and play. You can just buy the software and start. So that's exactly it. what happened. Yeah, that, that's exactly what happened. So now, I'm fortunate to be in a position where we're really enabling companies to start operations in absolutely no time. So the barriers to entry have really reduced, which fundamentally benefits the end customer. Because look, that's going to reduce costs, finally. So so that's what it is. Mm, Amazing. Okay. So uh, tell me like from a timeline-wise also how the journey had been going. This year 2016 mid was when we started off with our SaaS journey. We got to put out the product with our first three or four customers the last mile are Saudi. Yeah, no, so the last mile and then the first mile and the mid mile. So it went in that sequence because last mile and first mile are pretty much similar. So because the location that does last mile, we also do first mile. So we solve for first and last mile and then we solve for mid mile. So the first about... But the by when year, had you yeah. built the full stack? So that was mid 2018. So mid 2018 or so, so about two, two and a half years, second half of 2018. We have built out and we got three or four kind of anchor customers. 2019. And what yeah. revenue were you doing then in 2018? We were doing about a million dollars in ARR. And this was pure subscription, like a... Yeah, all pure subscription. And what is the way you priced it? Was it like based on number of yeah. transactions or number yeah, of yeah, seats? Yeah. Or transactions? So, so we, yeah, we did it based on number of shipments built monthly. Mm-hmm. So in a per shipment price. We hadn't thought about it that much, but that's one of the best decisions we made because the consumption-based pricing automatically results in revenue growth as the customer is growing and as the industry is growing because seats don't grow as fast. Shipments grow fast. See, because increasingly, if you do, say, 100 more shipments, you're not going to get 10 more drivers. You want to do it with the same number of drivers and optimize and do that. So that was one of the very good decisions. And I think retrospectively speaking when I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs these days so people don't really look at pricing at the start of their journey and I tell them that look pricing is extremely important see because once you quote a price in the market you've drawn a line in the sand because then that price is going to be referred to every single time and you can't take that back right so pricing is actually very important I know everyone thinks that yes we need to get customers we need to get something going etc etc but pricing is important. So I think, and then thankfully, we kind of, looking back at it, it seems, and then when, at the time, it was also a risk, right? Because companies were growing. If they don't grow, we don't grow. But if they grow, we grow. And it just happened to be that the logistics industry was growing very fast. So yeah, so by mid-2018, early 2019 is when we scaled up across about five or six anchor customers. We were doing about a million, uh, not a million, about 800,000, seven, six to 700,000 shipments on a daily basis. And uh, these are some of our anchor customers, right? Uh, and then uh, essentially is when we said that we, I mean, and at the time it was just kind of me doing a lot of the sales and then still I, I love sales and I love uh, anything uh, related to revenue and growth and stuff like that. Uh, but it's not, yeah. not like a, it's not like you have a large pool that you need to sell to. I guess your yeah. audience is a limited number of. It's limited. It's limited. Yeah. There would be like 10, 15 companies in each country. Yeah, there are 10, 15, 20 companies in each country. One question, how did you build a global product? Say, wouldn't there be local nuances around? Yeah. So uh, tell me about that. What are the local nuances? How does it differ so I think from? Like things, yeah, yeah for, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So for example, when we went to Saudi, so the first thing we realized was we had built our entire system based on pin codes. 
<laughs> there are no pin codes or zip codes in okay. Saudi. There's okay. nothing. It's mm-hmm. just it's and it's surprising it's how the operate. Right? Of the... So, yeah, exactly. So, right? so that was a big issue. And then see, but we've been very agile. And see, one of the things that actually sets us apart as well, uh, Akshay, is the fact that in the core team and top down, we're technology first. So we all come from a super deep technology background and everyone is extremely hands-on in that sense. Whether it be actually really, so we have the whole system from pin codes to area codes overnight. We said that, look, let's abstract it. Why don't we create a hierarchy of area codes? And then we make that popular. And then that really caught on in the market. And now almost every company operates over there based on area codes. So, so what, are, what are, yeah. like you gave codes on your own? Like for each yeah. region, you gave it a code? It, it, each area, yeah. We uh, crawled a lot of publicly available area names, city names, etc. And when an address would come in, we would have, because address, and the other thing was language. It's Arabic. It's also from a text standpoint, it's difficult because it's to left. The whole app reverses, the whole dashboard reverses, everything reverses. We do that, but we figured out all the libraries that kind of help us do that. And uh, But yes, doing, let's say, address identification in complex addresses in Arabic, that's a whole different problem statement because you need to uh, transliterate it, retain the context, and then try to do some sort of geocoding, geomapping based on that. So we developed this entire machine. Well, were you uh, scanning the addresses or was it being entered in a form by a customer or something? So, see, in e-commerce, see, because logistics companies work with e-commerce companies, you have to mandatorily take the text address. You have to. So, even today, when you go on Flipkart or Amazon, you have to fill up a text address. Unlike a hyperlocal, like a Swiggy or Zomato, where you pin your location and that's good enough, here you have to write your address. Now, why is that the case? Because fundamentally, that box is going to be traveling from somewhere to somewhere else. And a lot of things are still driven by people looking at the box. And the address mm-hmm. on the box. Mm-hmm. If you just put geo coordinates on that, people won't be able to do a sorting. <laughs> so even till date, sorting happens based on looking at the address and just putting it mm-hmm. into different bins. So, but, but do you like do a OCR of written address? Like someone can we write down yeah, the address. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that was one of the innovations that we did because we realized that to do accurate last mile delivery, addresses are very important. And addresses are very important, but a lot of people still give printed or handwritten addresses. They, don't, they won't go to a separate system and do the data entry. We had all the APIs, we had all of that, right? People still wouldn't do it, right? Especially in a customer to customer kind of landscape, right? You still, if you want to send something, you just write it down and give it, right? So we got to build this tech where, and this actually ended up reducing massive cost for our customers. Well, otherwise they would have this huge amount of data entry happening at each of the branches and a lot of errors, things like that. What we gave is for all the field executives on their app, they could just take a photograph and it would uh, read all of the address. It would classify it as, you know, name, line one, line two, city, state, country, phone number, zip code, pin code, all of those things. Right? So I think, see, one of the things that we've really done is, see, we realized earlier on that the industry that we're in, we are a must-have for any customer, we're not a good-to-have, which makes it very critical for us to be super effective. And we need to solve real-world problems. It's not about having a fancy dashboard and a fancy app. It's not about the bells and whistles. It's about making it work on the ground. And see, this actually came to us because we did it ourselves. We did the operations. For one month, I was actually myself doing pickups and deliveries. So I realized that bad routing, <laughs> it, it really impacts your day. You end up at a place and you realize that it's not here. It's some whole distance away. And then you just... So that whole empathy... For people on the ground and to really ensure that the system helps them. It's not a means for data collection. It means for audit. That is an end goal, obviously. I have been digitized, automated, all of those things. But only if it is actually effective on the ground will it work. So we did things like this. Then we did things like complete offline working of the app. Because there's a lot of cases where you're in some society, they are under some and it does not work. You're in a basement. A lot of go- there are go-down based deliveries. What do you do over there? So the system must work offline. There are some remote parts of the country where it is a challenge in some parts. It does come when you go travel around. So we are made such that the app works offline. Then entire local language. We made sure that the app has to work in local languages. Complete training within the app. Mm-hmm. So a lot of things were... Like the, the field executive. Companies can just hire field executives and tell them. Yeah, yeah. Because it again, their own. Yeah, because the attrition is super high in this industry. So yeah, if you're spending like 15 days people learning in a job where people usually churn out in four or five months, that's a lot of loss. That's a huge loss. So I think that's 
and all the stuff that we did. And so in 2019, so we were kind of at that stage where we scaled up with a few of our anchor customers. We built out the product across first, mid and last mile. And like you said, it's not an unlimited universe. It's a limited universe. At the same time, it was critical for us to achieve success there. Because, see, that's the thing. It's very important to just stay focused and get the numbers. Otherwise, you can just keep running around that, oh, it's not a big market. Let's try something else. Let's try something else. No, it's not like that. However, smaller market can be, if you're 60% of that market globally, that's huge. Any market is huge, right? So that was our goal that, look, we just need to be like 60% of this market. We don't want to be a 10% or a 5%. We want to be like 60%. And there's nobody else who's doing this or are there other companies which do so this? There are, so the interesting part is there are no global leaders. When you talk about ERP, there's an SAP. When you talk about CRM, that's Salesforce. But when you talk about logistics and supply chain, then nothing really comes to your mind. The interesting part is there are no global leaders. Of course, see, at the time and when we were doing it, other people did come around that were doing similar things, but they're all startups are level of maturity. Yeah, but then we said that, look, we need to go and we need to expand in terms of you know, product that we have with a few minor changes and tweaks. What other industries can we help? So we didn't want to obviously build out a whole new product because that's doesn't make any sense because you've gotten to product market fit. So you want to really extract as much as you can. So we were in that extract phase. So he said that, look, a lot of the customers of our logistics companies, a lot of them, they have their own fleet. So then we partnered with India's largest pizza delivery chain. They had their own fleet and we helped them with the last one delivery from the restaurant to the home. Pretty right. similar. Exactly, exactly the same thing. Yeah, exactly the same thing. And then we also realized that, okay, people that are doing white goods, like uh, AC TV fridge, that can't go in courier. You need to have your own yeah. fleet to do it. Yeah, yeah, Chroma would have its own. Exactly. So the India's largest retailer, we onboarded them into white goods. So we onboarded them and then in, until date, their pan India deliveries are powered by our platform. Yeah. Then we realized that, say, uh, pharmacies, delivery from the nearby pharmacy store to your home. Again, people have their own fleet. So you'll see a lot of times they come and they deliver things. So the, is you talking about pharmacy tech, like those startups, like 1MZ and all? Yeah. Exactly. But there are a lot of the established guys like Pharmacy, Wellness Forever. So yeah, all of these. So they're there. So, so we realized a lot of different use cases were there. And then we also built out an aggregation engine to say that, look, the thing that you're doing at the start, but still a tech layer. To say that, look, if you have your own fleet or you're working with multiple carriers, how can you still have this one unified layer or platform that can help you work across your own fleet, if it's own fleet, the route optimization, route planning, if it's a CPL, how to intelligently, how can a machine learning engine kind of help select the best carrier, make the best decision, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of how then we graduated to saying that, look, let's go to a separate set of customers. So we realized QSR is a good industry. We realized white goods is a good industry. We realized furniture is a good industry. Was furniture transport again happens to one fleet. We realized pharmacies is a good industry. We realized the grocery is a good industry. Fish and meat is a good industry. All these different adjacent and that then really increased our time. So by groceries, are you talking of say like a Unilever, Hindustan Unilever? No, not FMCG. No, like, like, like a big bar. Like the quick commerce, yeah, okay. those kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, those kind of, or supermarkets. So mm. three of India's largest supermarkets are on our platform doing deliveries from store to door, right? Okay. India. Like a big bazaar. So. Exactly, right? More retail, Spencer, Starquick, Tata Starquick, all of these. And then uh, quick commerce companies. So... India's largest 10-minute delivery company there on our platform. So we did, uh, we partnered with a lot of uh, these companies and so today, yeah. more than 3 million. So, well, one question. Yeah. so, so Zepto was launched on the back of this, like, like they were able to just yeah, yeah, yeah. plug in. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So exactly. that's the whole thing. So for example, speed to market. So see, if you look at the value proposition, see, for the established companies, it's about saying that, look, they need a technology partner. Obviously, any company in the world will have goods moving. Technology is not their core internal forte. So they need a plug and play tool to manage it. Just so today, nobody goes and builds their own CRM, right? So yeah, you just buy it off the market. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, go yeah, like absolutely. a Freshworks or a Zoho or a Salesforce or a HubSpot. You just buy something from the market. So why should your entire logistics supply chain? Why should you have to build internally for that? So everyone needs some system. So that is the hygiene part of it. That you need some system to do it. We are one of them. And then there are two men. There's no global leaders that we're competing against, so to say. For the new age companies that had the capability of building their own tech. Logistics and transportation and delivery just happened to be something where time to market was very important. And it was something that is standardized. So people differentiate based on the speed of picking in the warehouse. 
logistics isn't as much a differentiator. Right? It's core, but it cannot be a massive differentiator. And second is you just want to be fast to market. Even if you can build it, it'll take you six, eight months, nine months to build something strong. And meanwhile, the SaaS is constantly progressing. There are new upgrades coming in every single month. So how do you compete with that? With learnings globally. So that's how for both the established enterprises and the new age. Look, we actually didn't sell to new age startups for the longest time. We thought that obviously they'll have their own tech. <laughs> but then we realized that there is this concept of speed to markets. That anyone can build it if they want to. But why would you? Right? Once, once you've raised funds, then the clock is ticking. You need to show numbers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Amazing. You said you are now integration with third party logistics. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. W- what does that mean? Do you, are you doing API integration with yeah. the ERPs of the third party logistics so that there is yes. two way from yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's Let's exactly what we that, do. Like yeah. that feature. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, if you're a retailer or if you're a distributor or a manufacturer, you're going to be working with a mix of part of it being your own fleet and part of it being third party logistics companies. You need an engine that can help you orchestrate across all of this. Think about it in terms of a completely automated engine that automates all of your decisions. Now, literally, what you do is you say that, look, if my shipment, if as a retailer, I can make rules, I can say that, look, if it is of type prepaid, I want the cheapest delivery because fine, it's anyways prepaid. If it's COD, I want the fastest delivery because I want to ensure that I get my cash. And all the complexity is handled by Shipsy. We say, we scan through all of your contracted carriers. We say that look for this origin destination pair, for this weight of the shipment, for this price, for this COD amount, for this, that, blah, blah, blah. Millions and millions of decision points. Right? All compressed into an answer within 500 milliseconds of which is the best carrier. Right? Generating the airwayable number or the shipping label number of that carrier. Generating the actual label that has to be affixed on the package. Integrating and providing complete uh, tracking related information. Completely automating communication to the end customers in the branding of the retailer. And hence reducing returns. That's the holy grail at the end of it. How can you reduce returns and hence reduce costs? So that's kind of the end-to-end journey, so to say. And this is now picking up in a big way for us because nobody wants to have their own fleet. (laughs) <laughs> Let's be clear about that. Amazon built out their own internal logistics because at the time, logistics companies were not good enough to meet the customer expectations. But now with technology companies like us coming and helping logistics companies improve, the world has changed. Right? Yeah, so that's... Uh, so this, uh, how many uh, logistics companies have you integrated with? So I'm assuming that the moment yeah. the system gives a decision that use this vendor, you would also yeah. automate the communication to that vendor that this is the order. Yeah, we are integrating with them. Yeah. So look, we use the contract of the retailer and the logistics company. We don't come in between that. So the rates are agreed directly between the retailer and the logistics company, which is the AI-based decision-making engine. The retailer configures the rules on our platforms. So it's a completely self-serve SaaS platform in that sense. We've integrated with 90 plus logistics companies, actually 100 plus now around the world. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've also integrated with a lot of other types of carriers, but yeah, so that's where it is. Okay. So uh, let's take the example of say Zepto, which could use its own fleet or it could use yeah. the shadow facts, which also yeah. does last while. Uh, so you would be able to dynamically take those decisions exactly. for whether own fleet, yeah, yeah. whether or yeah, let's facts. say uh, also talk to shadow facts, like you would say, the order APIs. We would automatically send that, generate the number fetch or the tracking updates automatically centralize that. See, because again, if I need to integrate 10 different companies as a retailer, that's going to take up my bandwidth. And why do I do that? When there is a single API solution that does this entire two-way communication, why invest? Why not focus? Because anyway, engineering bandwidth is very limited. <laughs> and uh, it's a big uh, maramari for good engineers, right? So I mean, people want to focus. So it all comes down to that, that you focus on your core. And whatever is SaaS, you adopt it. So that's what it is. And the orchestration engine, it's capable of real-time checking the serviceability, availability, cost, performance, turnaround time, all of these different things. Like tracking Uh, where the order is, estimated time of everything. everything. All of that through API, you are able to give that data back. Okay. 
Yeah. Do you monetize this uh, separately? No, because you're not contracting with Shadowfax, for example. Zepto is no, not. And we'll never Shadowfax. do that. Yeah, and we'll never do that. See, one thing we're very clear about Action is that we will always be a neutral tech platform. We will never compromise on our neutrality. See, the moment we start favoring certain logistics companies, we lose our neutrality. So we will all, or, or the moment we, if we decide to have our own drivers, we will become competitors to our partners. So we will never do that. So we're very clear, we will always remain a neutral technology platform facilitating the collaboration between all the ecosystem entities that are there. But there could be a play of telling a company that you don't even have to bother contracting with Shadowfax and with XYZ. You yeah. will do the, we, we have preferential rates from all of these vendors and you yeah. have signed up with it. I think this is what ShipRocket okay. does. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And look, and then you would have read about the issues that are coming where logistics companies raise the prices overnight. Because again, see, the point is, Information asymmetry goes only so far. Now, now think of the airline industry. It's all democratized. You can't get different prices on, let's say, Indigo's website and a make my trip. You'll get the same price. So those days are gone. Like where that kind of information asymmetry is there because the rate itself is commoditized. Right? You cannot play on information asymmetry. And the thing that you're talking about, the headache of managing, that has to be tech. There has to be an AI layer that does all of that stuff. And you should not have a team of people looking at calls and managing. What do you have to manage? See if the technology is self-learning. And if a supply chain is self-improving. You don't really need an army of people to substitute for that. So that's just sugarcoating the problem in our view. That, okay, fine. Uh, the core might be bad, but we'll have a great support layer. Because <laughs> 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 what do you do? You can't help it. You just, you're basically shifting the blame from here to there. And according to us, that doesn't really add value. And see, the most important part is we will always be neutral and we will never do anything that compromises our neutrality. So that's the important part. So most of these, you have two customer segments. One is a pure logistics business here, DTDC. And second yeah. is companies which are selling products where logistics is part of the offering. Yeah. So the first large industry for us is logistics third party logistics. The second is retail, where retailers work. And so retail has many sub-segments. There's apparel, there's white goods, there's furniture, there's electronics, there is fashion and lifestyle, furniture, all of these things. And then there's the hyper-local retail, which is grocery, supermarkets, QSR, food, patient meat, pharmacies, all of these things. Then is the kind of manufacturing. So look, what we realized working with retailers was that they don't just have domestic distribution. Almost all retailers globally have imports also. They import goods from around the world and distribute it. And look, we also built up the thesis that we want to be a platform, not just a tool. That, because see, if you're a tool, we can be easily replaced. Salesforce is a platform. SAP is a platform. People can build services on top of it. Right? So we want to be a platform. We don't want to be a tool that's easily replaceable. Right? And that's kind of where we said that, look, we need to add more things to capture the entire wallet of the customer. And for the retailer, we said, then look, why not have the entire import automation also in place? Okay. And what I, does that involve? What, what is yeah. So, exactly. Right? If you see that, if you order a washing machine, for example, or if you get some furniture from somewhere, that's most likely getting imported from different parts of the world. So now, how does that entire thing work? So essentially, let's say if I'm importing from, let's say, country A, let's say China, for example. I'm looking at the China to India. First thing I would need is the freight. So essentially when you're talking about container and ocean, the rates are dynamic. It's not you contract for a year and the rates remain the same. You need to procure the freight. And that's kind of where... So procure the freight means buy space on a ship to... The container. So basically it's for containers, containerized freight, you need to procure the freight for the container. So your space on the ship is a container basically. So that's the unit entity right? in that sense. And you either do it by working with freight forwarders. So again, so now there are more entities. <laughs> there's a freight forwarder that comes in or there's a shipping line. There's a freight forwarders could be DB Schenkers, DSVs, Kuninagals, Expeditors, all these large global freight forwarders. And your shipping lines directly, it could be like a MERSC or a CMA, CGM or a Hapagloid or Evergreen or some of these. And uh, so that's the first part, which is freight procurement. So we have a bidding system through which you can send out inquiries, RFQs, get all the rates, 
on the platform. The system automatically tells you L1, L2, L3. You make the best decision and you finalize the rate. So this would yeah. happen like you would trigger an email to all of these and ask them to bid and they would get a link where they can submit it. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's absolutely what it is. And once they're on the platform, then they start getting notifications. And then we also have a mobile app, like an iOS and Android based mobile app where you get the notifications. And so then we start making it easier and easier for these freight forwarders really respond faster. They could digitize all of their rates. They could, they could digitize the rates. They could just give one click responses, tiering of prices across customers, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this is about the whole collaboration piece. So the platform keeps extended. There's the first bit, which is the freight procurement. The second is really once you procured the freight, you need to do all the documentation. So we have the shipment execution module which means your entire of all of the documents and movement of the container till it reaches the origin port. The entire thing can be managed on a single platform, collaborating with all your internal teams and collaborating with the freight forwarders. So things that would otherwise take about 800 or 900 emails, uh, sorry, 80 to 90 emails per shipment and thousands of emails across all of your different shipments on a daily basis. All of that gets Allocated on a single platform where everyone has visibility that, okay, what is spending on me? By when do I need to do it? And there's a digital document vault that actually has all of the information. So brings in sort of efficiency. Again, the whole vision towards becoming the Bloomberg kind of equivalent. So there's a second piece, right, which is this whole documentation execution part. The third is track and trace. Okay, so now that you've done the documentation, I want to track the shipment as it's coming in to India. Right, so then we built out integrations with 60 plus shipping lines. So now we're integrated with 60 plus shipping lines. We're integrating, integrated directly with the vessels. See, because a lot of times shipping lines don't update information correctly. So we need to actually get, and then vessels are mandated to relay their live location to the satellite. And that's public information. So you would have seen during this crisis in the Suez Canal, all those images of ships crowding and the vessel, uh, it is diagonally stuck over there. So. Yeah, but yeah, so we do uh, all of that automatically. It's all auto-integrated uh, into the platform. And there's a third piece, which is the track and trace. So then that kind of completes the journey. And the last is the invoice reconciliation. That doing all of this, you'll get eight or nine invoices per shipment. You need a way to automatically reconcile it. I procured this freight. Did I actually get billed as per that? You'll be surprised how many gaps are there in, in invoicing. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, why do you get eight, nine invoices? Because there are different stakeholders, each stakeholder. There are provided. different stakeholders and the, each stakeholder provides a different invoice. There is a, a container inspection invoice, there's a cleaning invoice, there's a customs invoice, there is a freight invoice, there is a this invoice, that invoice. So there are all different types of stakeholders that give their own invoices. Okay. And you're building this with some anchor customers as you did with the logistics SaaS? So, yes, actually we did. And so India's largest exporter so far, the entire petrochemicals, which actually amounts to about 3% of India's trade, is all managed through the ShipSea platform today. And then some of India's largest steel manufacturing companies. So I you're doing know. both export and export? as well. It's both. Yeah. Yeah. So now basically, so our platform at this stage, it's around the domestic distribution and the cross-border logistics. So you can think of us as either a container on a ship or a box on a truck. That's what it is. Amazing. Okay. So what is your go-to market? You have a lot of marquee names uh, as your customers. Yeah. How no. did you acquire them? So look, as see, we are an enterprise software company and then we focus on larger accounts. So ours is a very focused, targeted GTM, right? So it all starts with marketing where we have a clear database and universe of customers that we need to go to. We know, okay. Logistics, these are the categories, subcategories. The retail, these are the categories, subcategories. Manufacturing, these are the categories, subcategories. And then you draw out your time and the typical size of the different customers, etc., etc. Then there's a lot of work around content to generate inbound leads for the rest of the world because you obviously can't map out the whole world. So you'll obviously miss a few. You'll miss lots, actually. So you need to get your inbound strategy and then you can need to get your outbound strategy. Or you yeah. publish a lot of content around logistics, yeah. workflows, yeah. automation, digitization. and Yeah, trends, so that all the, of those things. Yeah. So yeah. you start ranking when someone is searching. So yeah, there are SEO, SEM, yeah. So both organic okay. and paid. And uh, yeah, even till day north of 60% of our revenue comes through inbounds. People going on our website and requesting for demos, right? 
So that's one chunk. The second big chunk is a very targeted outbound. So we do top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel, top of the funnel stuff like webinars, email campaigns, all of those things. And then middle of the funnel, which is more kind of nurturing these leads, sending them case studies, all of the stuff. And bottom of the funnel, we have kind of inside sales that does the calling and that does all the warm or hot leads. And then it comes to meeting and then we have the sales team that takes it up from the initial meeting to then getting the demo, the proposal, and then signing the contract. And you did sales, like you told me. So we now have a head of, yeah, yeah, for the long, uh, yeah, I still love sales. (laughs) Wow, amazing. Amazing. So what's your vision for the next couple of years? Do you see yourself getting to a unicorn status or, you know, what I want to understand that. Yeah. Yeah, look, absolutely. We kind of measure ourselves in terms of the success we bring for our customers and the success we bring overall to the ecosystem. And the more we can drive that, the better we rank ourselves and not more so in terms of funding things like that. And honestly, over the last few years, things have really changed. Last mile has seen a massive push. But at the same time, there's a lot of uh, uh, concerns around global warming and how logistics, transportation is a big contributor to carbon footprint and greenhouse gases. And we do consider ourselves that once you've done the kind of digitization automation, we now need to drive a lot of key outcomes on a global scale as well. And that's where sustainability is actually playing a central role in our strategy. How can we reduce the total miles traveled for a package? And how can we make those miles traveled greener? So, for example, things like route optimization, route planning, it reduces the miles traveled. Efficient communication with end customers, making sure that the shipment gets delivered in the first attempt itself. You don't need to make multiple attempts. That reduces the miles traveled. Right? And, for example, choosing, say, bicycles for less than one kilometer. Right? That makes these miles traveled greener. Or prioritizing electric vehicles right? in the aut- automation or, or optimization engine. These make the miles greener or choosing shipping lines that have more sustainable emissions when it comes to fuel that they're using. So I think these are some of the other decision-making points that kind of come in to the engine that really drives key global outcomes around sustainability and overall efficiency enhancements for enterprises. And that brings us to the end of this amazing conversation. At this point of time, I'd like to make a request. I want to know what you think about the show and how we can improve it. Do you have suggestions? Do you want to discuss your startup ideas? Is there any way in which we can add more value to you as a listener? I love reading your emails and suggestions. Please write to me at ad at the podium.in. That's ad at the t-h-e podium p-o-d-i-u-m dot in.